Hello, everyone. This is Matt Schlapp, and welcome to another episode of CPAC Live. Uh, we are all looking in the headlines of watching television and seeing the atrocities uh, in Hong Kong. And as most of you know, we had a pop-up CPAC uh, on the streets of Hong Kong with these brave democracy protesters. And today, uh, we hope to spend a lot of time talking about what's going on in Hong Kong. Uh, we're going to at first be joined by Morgan Ortegas, the State Department spokesperson right there at the right hand of the great Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo. And we'll also be joined by uh, one of our outstanding board members of the American Conservative Union, Gordon Chang, who's really the go-to person outside of government uh, that uh, so many people inside government uh, go to try to get advice on how to handle this powder keg of what's going on in Hong Kong. But uh, first, I'm really proud to have a, a great friend and really talented person, someone um, that Mercy worked closely with when they were both at Fox, uh, Morgan Ortegas. Uh, thanks for being with us at CPAC Live. This is awesome. I'm, this is my first time doing CPAC Live. I think it's great that you're doing this. And uh, thanks for having me, Matt. Well, you know, um, we didn't know when we went to Hong Kong, uh, we were invited by the protest leaders, really the first Western group uh, to be invited. It was quite an honor. And um, we didn't really know how this was going to go, but I have to say, it didn't feel like it was going to get resolved. Uh, now we fast forward to what uh, the Trump administration is doing vis-a-vis -vis China and Hong Kong. Can you get our viewers up to speed on how the policy is shifting? Absolutely. And it's definitely fast moving, as you said. So what happened this week is uh, the secretary, Mike Pompeo, is required by law to certify to Congress that Hong Kong is autonomous from China. So um, almost everybody, your CPAC viewers are super smart people. So they'll remember back in 1997, uh, China uh, made a commitment to the people of Hong Kong and to and to the world, right? Because this there, this was also signed at the United Nations. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party made the commitment that for 50 years, uh, Hong Kong would remain autonomous uh, from China, and so uh, we would have essentially two separate systems. So um, here we are. We still have 27 years left on that commitment. And last March, March 2019, uh, Secretary Pompeo did the annual certification to the Congress that Hong Kong is indeed highly, what we call a high degree of autonomy from China. Well, right after that, we saw something come into effect, which is an extradition law that was uh, passed in the parliament in Hong Kong. And, and, and a lot of these parliamentarians are controlled by Beijing. And so this extradition law essentially took away the, the rights of Hong Kong citizens it would, ha it would have enabled them to be sent to the mainland, to China, extradited for any sort of whatever infraction um, the Chinese Communist Party came up with. Um, and so what you saw then was one of the largest demonstrations um, that we've seen anywhere in the world. Right. Thousands, thousands of people, you saw it firsthand, yep. demonstrating on the street, peaceful protesters. Um, and so we, we immediately saw a violent crackdown on those protesters. We saw lots of arbitrary arrest and detainment. You know, there's there's some great people that I would encourage um, anybody from CPAC who's listening and, and is really into following this. Uh, Jimmy Lai and Joshua Wong on uh, on Twitter. They are um, Hong Kong uh, pro democracy. Well, I'll tell you, Morgan. We uh, when we were there, uh, Jimmy Lai actually invited us into his home. Wow. That was the last night we were in Hong Kong. The sad thing is, is that um, uh, his home was later firebombed. Uh, oh. Because we were there, and uh, the, the the Beijing government clearly did not like the fact that CPAC, which is so closely associated, obviously with the types of great form policy initiatives that Donald Trump and the Secretary are pushing around the globe, they didn't like us being there. And right. uh, and we met with uh, other leaders like Andy Chan and others, um, and. You know, it was it was very moving, but it's also it's very raw because Jimmy, as you know, uh, I don't know what his status is now. I believe he's out of jail, but he's it's, he's been arrested he's, a couple times. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we saw exactly as you said, Jimmy and, and other pro-democracy activists arrested. So we watched this unfold over the past year. Um, Mike Pompeo, secretary of state, of course, delayed his report to Congress because we were we were still watching, and you know there was somewhat of a hope that the Chinese Communist Party, we'll call them the CCP for short on this on this uh, video cast, 
Uh, we were hoping that they would come to their senses and stop this, but instead they announced um, last week that when their National People's Congress was con would convene this week, that they would take up what they call the national security legislation. Um, they're, they're essentially using national security to crack down on Hong Kong. They're calling people like Jimmy Lai and all these peaceful protesters that you met, they're calling them terrorists. Um, and so once that they announced that they would be passing this legislation, we knew that that was effectively removing the autonomy uh, that Hong Kong has from Beijing. So the first step in this whole process happened this week. Um, Secretary Pompeo, a, a hallmark of our of Trump foreign policy is that we recognize reality around the world. We talk about the world, we see the world as it is, not as we want it to be. And I think- Which is awfully important because you can get America into a lot of trouble with an idealized view right. of how people should make decisions instead of how they will. Absolutely. So we, there's no way that Mike Pompeo could have gone to the Congress and certified that Hong Kong is still autonomous from China, given given the events. So we did make that certification to, to Congress. Um, and then you saw um, overnight, not last night, but the night before our time, the National People's Congress did impose that legislation. Um, and of course, President Trump uh, made announcements today about the uh, continuing steps that we're going to take to hold uh, Beijing accountable. I, and I want to just say, Matt, that I think, and again, your viewers are so sophisticated. I know, thank you for having me speak at, and, and the secretary, thank you for having us speak at CPAC this year. Um, so your viewers will know when I say this, I think that this is a, a pivotal moment in history. And we say that a lot, we say that around elections. I think this week is the week that my children and, and your grandchildren are going to study uh, because this is a moment in time when democracies, when people who cl claim to love human rights, to love freedom, this is their moment to stand up for the rule of law, to stand up against uh, communist thugs who are trying to take over the largest financial capital in Asia. And every country uh, will go down in history for how they stood at this moment. You know, we uh, when we were invited into Hong Kong, uh, we had also had CPACs. Uh, we've had three in Tokyo, and that's kind of how we started uh, going into Asia, into an important capital, as you know, a, a great ally of the United States. We have issues that we're trying to resolve because we live in reality, but right. um, it's great to see two important leaders like Abe and the president working so closely together. Uh, and we've also uh, had a CPAC in South Korea, um, which is also a place that we're very worried um, about the state of democracy, the use of uh, kind of like tactics to jail your opponents, um, your political opponents. Um, and you know, you see this around, you see China's menacing words towards Taiwan. China is an unsavory neighbor. Uh, it's a dangerous neighborhood. What should uh, the CPAC community understand about how both the president and the secretary are approaching China? Yeah, they and I should say the government, right? The communist government, the CCP. Sure. Thank you so much for making that distinction. Um, and that's an incredibly important distinction because the Chinese people are the ones that are subjugated to this um, to this communist government. You know, you see things like I was just talking to Hugh Hewitt this morning, actually. And, and Hugh and I were talking about the fact that Chinese Communist Party officials, especially China uh, ambassadors, Chinese ambassadors, uh, prolifically are using Twitter now and their own people are banned from doing it. You know, we often talk about the uh, COVID-19 crisis and what's happened around the world. And we always, Secretary Pompeo and I always try to distinguish the Chinese people from the Chinese government because, you know, the real heroes of coronavirus, remember, are these doctors um, who lost their lives, blowing the whistle very early. That's in right. Alerting the world, journalists in China, you know, a lot of them were uh, arrested we, and, uh, and many of them died. Or well, many let me jump on that just for a second, Morgan, because there was a Washington Post reporter on Twitter the other day who taught, who was kind of mocking President Trump that she said Chinese media were, uh, were kind of poking at the president. And I, Twitter responded to her and, and I just said, there are no Chinese media. Yeah. Like, it's don't legitimize the propaganda uh, system that Beijing has set up. There used to be freedom of the press in Hong Kong that was much more expansive. They are tightening their grip on that. Western journalists love to act like there, it's, there's real journalism uh, on the mainland. 
Yeah, that's such a great point. I don't know who that journalist was, but that's a that's a surprising um, um, ignorance of how uh, how it works in China, as you just pointed out. Uh, you know, even you have to remember, even recently, uh, reporters from let's see, New York, I believe it's New York Times, Washington Post, and Wall Street Journal. I think those are the big three. Uh, American journalists from those outlets have been kicked out of China, and 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 some of them went to Hong Kong. Actually, now they have to figure out uh, what to do. You know, we actually went at the State Department. We went through a, a pretty expansive effort where we are looking at reciprocity. So, how are American diplomats and 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 American business people and American journalists treated in China versus how they're treated here in the United States? We have tried to take measures to make that relationship more reciprocal. One of the things that we've done is that we know these quote unquote media organizations are nothing more than Chinese Communist Party, CCP uh, propaganda outlets. Um, so we have put them on notice. Um, we have we have uh, kicked a lot of them out of the country or, or drastically reduced their numbers. So when their visas expire, they're no longer eligible for the for the uh, journalist visa that allows them uh, to be in the United States. Um, and so we're we're at the State Department. Uh, you know, we're constantly looking at, at what we call reciprocity because for too long, American diplomats and, and business people and journalists have been treated one way in the United, uh, excuse me, in China. And then of course, Chinese, uh, their Chinese equivalents have had so much more uh, freedom here. So we're going to make that relationship more reciprocal. Well, that's great, and we applaud you for uh, everything you're doing. Let me ask you a question. Specifically to these protesters, it's been a lot of young people in Hong Kong. Uh, I love the fact that they consider themselves Hong Kongers. Yeah. Uh, they're no longer referring to themselves as but Chinese. Language, as, as you know, you were there. I mean, they, they speak Cantonese. Yes, that's right. The um, you know, my wife uh, Mercy, uh, who you know, said to me, my kids prayed for all of us when we went into Hong Kong because we were a little bit worried. We don't come in with the diplomatic protocols that people like yourself go in with. So there was a certain bit of risk. We came in with one of our board members, Veronica Birkenstock from Dallas. We, we went with uh, Jay Aiba, the chairman of the Japanese Conservative Union, um, and with Andrew Cooper, who put on a CPAC in Australia last year. And so that's a great new tradition that we're starting in Australia. We all went together. and. Uh, my five girls, they prayed every night, and Mercy always tells the story of my youngest, Lucia, saying, um, we pray that the communists don't put daddy in jail. And uh, and the, I know, very sweet. She got it. Let me tell you, she wasn't confused like that Washington Post reporter. But, she, uh, but the other piece of this that Mercy brought up, she said, could you imagine if there was a stopwatch or a time clock on how long you'd have freedoms? And that's what Jimmy brought up to us. He was like, the kids get the fact that if, you know, in the 20 some odd years left in the agreement, you know, they'll still be young when those 25 years are done and they won't have to be able to have a life. That's why the young people have run to the streets. It's a beautiful but frightening thing to see. Yeah, well, I, I mean, that's I, I think so few people have had that firsthand experience that you've had seeing these protests. You know, I think Hong Kong really has a special place in the hearts of many Americans. I went there, um, I can't, I think it was, I can't remember if it was 2001 or 2002. I think it was 2001. I went there, don't laugh, but I was Miss Florida Citrus at the time. I was in college. Um, and I, went to, I think that's great. <laughs> I went to Hong Kong, Beijing, Shanghai to introduce Florida grapefruit to the uh, Chinese markets. I fell in love with Hong Kong. And I know so many students make the choice to do a semester abroad or a year abroad in Hong Kong, and I actually worked on Wall Street for a long time. So, you know, I mean, going to Hong Kong is like such a plum assignment. If you work yeah. for a major business or a major bank, you know, you get to be in, in the heart of Asia. And I, I can't tell you how heartbroken I was last week because I just knew no matter what steps the United States took, uh, that the Hong Kong that I think we all knew and loved, well, at least for a short amount of time, we'll see. But But it's essentially lost. And so we'll take measures, as the president has has said today, and the secretary said, we will take measures um, to defend uh, the rule of law and the people of Hong Kong. But, you know, one point that I think is so important to make is since Donald Trump has been president, one of the big conversations that you hear amongst think tanks and, and amongst all of us who care about foreign policy is, is the quote unquote erosion of the post-World War II order that's been led by the United States. 
And if anybody, and this is something that I've never, you know, agreed with. In fact, I think that our foreign policy strengthens our, our relationship with our allies because we demand things like people actually, you know, pay to be a part of, of NATO and other things. Um, but saying that, if, if, if your viewers um, and your members of CPAC want to know what a Chinese-led world order looks like, this is it. It's breaking promises. Right. It's breaking promises to the people of Hong Kong, breaking their promises to the world on the South China Sea, breaking their promises to the world on intellectual property theft, trade. I mean, you name it. They are. Look at Australia, for example, and then I'll stop talking. But when you look at Australia, they called for during COVID 19, uh, they called simply for an independent investigation. Into the origins of uh, into the origins of the coronavirus in Wuhan. So they said all they asked for was something simply what we have been asking for, which is independent scientists and credible doctors to be able to come in and find out how this virus started. To this day, to today, May what's today, 29th, China has still not allowed anyone like that in. So Australia led the charge. Um, I mean, we of course did as well, but Australia was one of the first nations to step up and say, yeah, we do need this independent investigation. The Chinese Communist Party started threatening Australia with their, uh, they do a lot of, there's a lot of different things that they trade, beef being one of them, but they immediately start the economic, uh, yep. bull the economic coercion for anyone who tries to stand up for the rule of law. So in the United States- You, you cannot separate the economic questions between China, America, and the world, and the national security questions. I think for, for, too, for too long, we thought, well, these are separate. And eventually they'll come together in a positive way. And what we've seen is they're all wrapped around. They use their economic power to push their global uh, domination uh, ideas and vice versa. Yep. And it has been, by the way, you know, this is the third administration that I've worked in. So I've worked for Republicans and Democrats for 40 years, you know, since, since Nixon really um, we have tried different mechanisms to get China to open up. We've allowed them into the WTO. Um, both both political parties, and, and by the way, I don't think this is necessarily a bad option. It's something we had to try. We said, if, if we open up to China economically, if they do business with America, if they do business with the West, uh, then, th then they will naturally, their political rights will open up. They will, uh, you know, they will become a more open society. It was a nice theory. It just didn't work out. <laughs> didn't work, and, and it has really yeah. been that up. Remember that uh, Chairman Xi only in the past, gosh, what is it, in the past two years has declared himself, you know, chairman uh, for life. And he yep. has to a, a number of things to, to really clamp down even more on China. So he has a very, you know, he has a vision for what he's doing with China. He will be there for the rest of his life unless something happens. Um, and he is on the march. Yeah, I, I agree. Morgan Ortegas, spokesperson at the State Department. We love the fact that you were able to make time to join us on CPAC Love uh, Live. We love the fact that you were able to join us at our large CPAC, which now it seems like years ago, but it was just months ago. And I, I make a promise to you, Morgan, we're gonna be back uh, in airplanes and on the road taking this CPAC vision, which really isn't a partisan vision. It is trying to work with other freedom-loving people in big and important capitals around the world and in small, uh, so, so that this is a type of kind of soft, unofficial diplomacy, which I think can help save the world. <laughs> That's all. I think it's really great that you guys are doing that. Really important. And awesome. thank you for having me, and I hope you invite me back to CPAC next year. I will be there live and in person. That's awesome. That's great. Uh, Morgan Ortegas, thank you for being with us at CPAC Live. We're going to be right back after this short video. Some people look at the killings of Christians in the Middle East or the imprisonment of Uyghur Muslims, ethnic Kazakhs, other believers in China and say, hey, look, that's not our problem. But I say, and President Trump says, oh, oh, yes, it is. It's our problem because the God that has blessed this country as the standard bearer for religious freedom is important everywhere. Uh, welcome back to CPAC Live. We're now joined by uh, someone we all have great respect for, one of our outstanding board members of the American Conservative Union, Gordon Chang, author of The Coming Collapse of China. Uh, Gordon, I think you're a prophet. Well, right now, China looks pretty strong, but I think that really what they're doing is because of their insecurities, they're lashing out at everyone. And so I think that this belligerence really is a symptom of weakness, not strength. 
Yeah, and let's get right to this. Sometimes authoritarian regimes and despots get the most aggressive right before there, there is a fear of perceived weakness. Do you think that they're, they're reaching out, they're cracked down in Hong Kong, they're increasing hostility in that neighborhood is because they know that they have to have this perception of how strong they are? Yeah. I actually think that Xi Jinping, the Chinese ruler right now, does feel insecure. Got to remember that uh, the Chinese people were white hot angry about the Communist Party's handling of the coronavirus epidemic. And, you know, there have been times in the past when the Chinese people have been upset, but there's never been a time when you've had two things at the same time, which is um, upset Chinese and an economy in contraction. I mean, uh, this is something that, uh, you know, for Xi Jinping and for the Deng Xiaoping and the following rulers, really is unprecedented. So I think that's what's driving them. Also, one other thing, Matt, I think the more that we look at the origins of the coronavirus epidemic and also what Chinese leaders did in December and January to spread the virus beyond China's borders, I think Beijing's trying to change the global narrative away from that conversation to things like Hong Kong, India, Taiwan. This is a really, really dangerous time. Well, I, what I can perceive is that they're using this kind of global shutdown as an opportunity to be a menace. Um, yes. So they're not, they're not, they didn't press the pause button. They, 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 they accelerated their plans, uh, you know, around their country. Yeah. You know, Xi Jinping, um, there are symptoms that he is in trouble inside the Communist Party, but he wouldn't be in trouble if he had foreign policy successes. So, for instance, if he were for able to dismember India, that would be um, that would play very well in Beijing. So I think that is really one of the reasons why we see, you know, the Chinese leaders right now acting in a way which is just so provocative. We haven't seen this in a very, very long time. We've been uh, uh, reaching out or some people have been reaching out to us about having a CPAC in India because it sends another message of who freedom loving people stand with. And obviously, India is a, a large democracy and we're finding ways in which the leader of their country and our country seem to want to collaborate, uh, it, you know, which was demonstrated with President Trump's outstanding state visit there. But uh, another important place we took CPAC was Hong Kong something very special to you and to your wife, Lydia. Uh, remind folks what, why we went there and why it was important. Yeah, we went there in, in August of last year, and it was important because then Hong Kong was um, seeing the anti-extradition bill protests um, starting in April of last year, but especially with the huge protests in June, there was continuous demonstrations in the streets of Hong Kong because Beijing wanted to be able to extradite people out of the territory into mainland China. Well, that extradition bill was withdrawn because of those protests. But what we see right now, Matt, is Beijing uh, exercising direct control over Hong Kong um, with this passage of Article 23 national security legislation in Beijing, bypassing Hong Kong's legislative council. That's triggered a whole new round of demonstrations. Um, as people say, what we're seeing in, in Hong Kong right now it's not just protest, it's an insurgency. And this insurgency has all sorts of implications. And, and that's why it was, I think, really important for ACU to go there to see what was happening and to inspire people in freedom, democracy, and liberty. And that one of the unfortunate uh, consequences of this global quarantining and shutdown is that really made it difficult for this protest movement, this insurgency, as you call it, Gordon, um, to, to, to be able to find a way to exist and have an impact? Well, during the early stages of the epidemic in Hong Kong, um, the uh, protests stopped. Um, but all throughout, um, the, the kids were, were still fighting the Hong Kong police. Um, you know, with insurgencies, Matt, um, they sometimes um, sort of appear like they go away, but they really don't. Because what's happening here is you have two sets of protests. You've got the kids dressed in black who are fighting the Hong Kong police, and you've got middle class Hong Kong people who take to the streets in the hundreds of thousands and sometimes even millions. Um, and, and really what you have right now you know is you have, about you have these. And that's what I learned uh, when we were on the streets of Hong Kong 
the digital yeah. experience of an insurgency that's communicating through you know apps like WhatsApp and such. And just so you know, this is a Samsung phone not made in China. <laughs> and, and this really is, is important because the kids are connected. Um, Hong Kong is a sophisticated society. Um, but what Beijing is trying to do is to infantilize the public there to say, no, you can't govern yourselves. And so uh, ultimately, this is a test of wills. Now, China has foreclosed the possibility of change through the law, through the legislative council. So we're going to see a struggle in the streets. And this is going to continue for a very long time because people there, they want to be free. They want to be free. And one of the people we met with that I just talked with Morgan about was Jimmy Lai. Give uh, the CPAC community an update of how, what he's up to. I saw him on uh, do a television interview the other day with Maria Bartiromo. It was good to see his face and hear his voice. Well, Jimmy was arrested um, since we saw him um, last August. Um, and he was arrested along with 14 other senior democracy figures. He is the publisher of the only pro-democracy newspaper in Hong Kong, Apple Daily, which also publishes in Taiwan. And um, Jimmy was very clear. He said, people in Hong Kong have a choice. They can either flee or they can fight. And he said, he's fighting. And he also said, look, they can kill me, but I'm not going to be intimidated. And as we know, that's Jimmy Lai. He will not be intimidated. He will be a force for liberty. And um, I think Beijing's going to have a very difficult time dealing with him. Uh, Gordon, uh, you have uh, been a real leader in this idea of supply chain and the offshoring of American jobs and Western jobs to China. Um, do you think that one of the only positive uh, outgrowths of the whole idea of Chinese corona, the Wuhan virus, is a lot of people have woken up to the downsides of uh, these globalist patterns? Yeah, we, we, we've seen that, Matt, um, because China has threatened um, to, for instance, cut off the supply of uh, personal protective equipment. Um, they actually turned around a ship which had masks, gowns and gloves bound for New York hospitals. Um, as Peter Navarro, the president's trade advisor, has said, um, they actually even nationalized an American factory producing N95 masks. So we know that China is not a reliable member of these global supply chains. We know that we have a really dangerous dependency on China for uh, pharmaceuticals and for the ingredients that go into uh, other pharmaceuticals. This is just something that we have got to reduce our reliance on China for. And we are seeing factories leave China. We are seeing the administration actually start to encourage this. Larry Kudlow, who's the president's chief economic advisor, actually has been talking about 100 percent expensing for um, factories that leave Chinese soil and move back to the U.S. That's a great thing. Um, this might not happen overnight, Matt, but it is occurring nonetheless. Yeah, and I love the idea of free trade and products that uh, can be made more effectively and efficient efficiently in other countries. This is great. I love the idea of these bilateral agreements with the United Kingdom, with Brazil, with Australia. Uh, I don't. I think the conservative movement has to advocate aggressively for free trade. But once again, when you think of China, it's not just economic freedoms that we should demand and we're not getting. It's also this idea of respecting the human rights of the individual and giving political yeah. freedoms. And they're just not running on the same track. No. Uh, you know, when you talk about trade, China does not believe in the notion of comparative advantage, which underpins this whole idea of international commerce. They've been stealing U.S. intellectual property to the tunes of hundreds of billions of dollars a year. And, um, you know, you can't really trade with them in a rules based order. And as you point out, even more important, China has been imprisoning two, maybe three million Uyghurs and Kazakhs in concentration camps. Um, we know that people are dying in those camps because Beijing has also been building crematoria. They're trying to eliminate ethnic identity and religion in China as well. Um, it, the list just goes on and on. Um, we have got to be concerned that these are crimes against humanity. And this is a, a China that declared a people's war on the U.S. last May. So th th they aren't kidding around. We've got to they, listen to what aren't. these guys are saying. Now, it's communism, right? Now, there's a particular brand with the CCP, but it's communism. When you see America reacting to the very serious health outbreak that we've had with this 
uh, virus. Um, but when you see America's reaction, where we literally shut her down, people, some people are in a semi-panic mode. We shut down our economy. We act like it's safe to work at some kind of companies that we order from and they deliver to our door, but somehow unsafe to go to smaller companies and we do similar things. You see the shutdown of the churches where these crazy things like in New Jersey, where literally they still uh, are not having church services, no matter how many masks you wear or how, many, how few people are there. Uh, you know, Tony Fauci was basically telling people like myself who are Catholic that there's no safe way to receive communion. Is there an irony here when you see the big, aggressive hand of the government in America kind of use an emergency to go too far? I, I'm in New Jersey. I'm in lockdown New Jersey. And the irony is that our governor um, has said, oh, uh, a liquor store is essential, but churches are not. And by the way, the First Amendment does not protect liquor stores. It does, however, protect the right to worship, which is in the First Amendment. And I think it's actually the first right in the First Amendment. It is. That's right. Because well, you, know, you, you always got to remind journalists that because they think the First Amendment was written to for the New York Times. And the <laughs> actually the First Amendment was written for the Christians in New York. So it's hard to it's hard to remind them of that. But uh, Gordon Chang, we appreciate, first of all, we appreciate very personally everything you do to make CPAC stronger and better as a board member. Um, we appreciate the fact that you have really good judgment, especially in your life partner, Lydia. And uh, we most particularly uh, uh, want to thank you for your calm, cogent analysis throughout the last years, but even just weeks and months on this whole question of China, I think you're giving people uh, a, a real indication of the stark reality of what's going on in China, the ramifications of the crackdown uh, in Hong Kong, and why America needs to make sure it picks the right leaders, because you know the consequences could be catastrophic. So anyway, Gordon, that was really meant to be a compliment. We appreciate uh, we appreciate you being with us on CPAC Live. We're going to have a whole slew of great shows next week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 3.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'll be talking with you on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook about all the great guests we're going to have. Um, it's been great doing the show, and thanks for joining us. Oh, well, Matt, it's an honor for Lydia and me to be associated with the, the ACU, um, which is absolutely a critical organization right now, because as you say, this is a consequential time. It is. Thank you, Gordon Chang. Thank you, CPAC. Thank you.